as we gather this morning, we remember in the Episcopal Diocese of Northern Michigan that we acknowledge the sacred land where we work, live, teach, learn, and build community. This land is the territory of the Anishinaabe people. We recognize the repeated violations of sovereignty, territory, and water perpetrated by European and other settlers that have impacted the original inhabitants of this land. We extend our respect to citizens of these First Nations people who live here and their ancestors who have lived here for over 500 generations and to all indigenous people. We also know that this acknowledgement is insufficient. It does not undo the harm that has been done and continues to be perpetrated now against indigenous people, their land, air, and water. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. No one can do like Jesus. And I'm mumbling word to say He went walking down to Lazarus' grave And he raised him from the dead Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land A weary land, a weary land My Jesus is a rock in a weary land a shelter in the time of storm When Jesus was on earth The flesh was very weak He took a towel and girded himself And he washed his disciples' feet Oh, Jesus is a rock and a weary land a weary land, a weary land, my Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Yonder comes my Savior, him who I love so well. The palm of victory and the keys of death and hell. No, oh, Jesus is a rock and a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock and a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, shelter. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to the Evangelist John. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, <clears throat> This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. 
Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. <clears throat> the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend, Lazarus, sleeps. But I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. They thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He or she who believes in me, though they may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly, went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, 
come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, who opened the eyes of the blind, also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. There was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Abba, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him, and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary, and had seen these things Jesus did, believed in him. Glory to you, O Lord. Glory be to you. Good morning. Today's story of the raising of Lazarus is the last story of Jesus' miracles, or as John called them, signs. It only appears in John's Gospel, and John presents it as the clearest sign of who Jesus is, the Son of God, the promised Messiah. Like Lent, it's also a sort of dress rehearsal for what's coming, because it's what sets in motion Jesus' own death and resurrection. Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters Martha and Mary. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was gravely ill, he immediately did nothing. To be fair, I, I don't exactly know what I expected him to do, and I think we all can feel powerless in the face of approaching death, but still nothing? Surely he could have done something. Jesus does tell his disciples, this sickness will not end in death. It is for God's glory, so that the Son of God will be glorified through it. But what kind of comforting words are those? Who wants to face the worst day of their lives and hear, this is for God's glory? No one. And neither, I believe, would Martha and Mary sitting at the bedside of their sick brother who's getting weaker with every hour. Where is Jesus? He should be here by now. Where is Jesus? He is slipping away. Where is Jesus? What good could he possibly be now? It's already too late. It's frustrating, isn't it, when God doesn't do what you think he should? Have you ever had an issue with God's timing? I know I have. I get anxious and afraid and start questioning. I'm sure most of us at some time in life have run into a situation and thought, how could God have allowed this to happen? One of the lessons John wants us to learn this morning is that when God seems to be doing nothing, he may be doing more than you could ever imagine. 
Jesus had declared that Lazarus' sickness was for the glory of God. Jesus knew God would be totally glorified in the situation at hand. We know that there will be times in the future when God doesn't do what we expect or think he should do. But we can also always know that in every situation, if he doesn't do what we think he should, it is very probable that God has something better in mind. God's timing is not our timing. When I think God is slow to answer, according to my timing, I need to remember that he alone is sovereign and he alone knows what I need and when I need it. The story of Lazarus reminds us that nothing is impossible for God and we shouldn't hesitate to ask him for anything. Jesus wants to believe this truth that Jesus is never late. His timing is always perfect. Jesus tells us story, John tells us the story of Lazarus' resurrection because he wants us to learn patience and trust. Patience and trust. That's something we all need to withstand the storms of life. God's timing is not our timing. His delay, his delay in coming to Lazarus is a perfect example. Jesus waited two days. Then he announced that he wanted to go to see Lazarus. He told his disciples plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Now the disciples, <coughs> the disciples knew that Jesus going to Judea was not a good idea. Going to Judea was dangerous. Last time we were there, the disciples said, they tried to stone you. Every time we go to Judea, the people get angrier. If we keep going back there, death is inevitable. If Lazarus is dead, the disciples protested, surely it's better to stay here where we are safe. <clears throat> and if Lazarus is dead, what can you possibly do? Nothing can, good can come from your dying too. But Jesus was going to go, so they did too. God's timing is not our timing. By the time Jesus shows up at the town, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Four days is important because four days means Lazarus was really dead. We have stories from the ancient world of people being put into tombs and then waking up a day later. Cases of heartbeats so faint their families got it wrong. But four days tells us this is not one of those times. Lazarus is really dead. Martha is the first one to come out to Jesus. She tried to get Mary to come with her, but Martha, Mary waved her away. Martha is the doer when there's a death. Martha is the one who does everything. She answers the door, answers the phone, takes the casseroles. She washes the dishes, talks with the funeral home, makes sure the eulogy gets in the paper. At other times, Martha is scolded for being the doer, but when someone dies, we all thank God for our Marthas because we wouldn't make it through without the Marthas. As the doer, Martha is the one who goes out to greet Jesus. As the doer, Martha is the one to confront Jesus. If you had been here, she says, my brother would not have died. And as the doer, Martha still seeks a solution. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. As the doer, Martha still wants something to be done. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the wife, life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha says yes. Meanwhile, Mary can't stop crying. Mary's the sensitive one. She doesn't feel like eating. <clears throat> She's in a fog. She's powerless. She's helpless in the face of death. Because let's face it. We are all powerless in the face of impending death. What can she possibly do? 
But Martha comes back to Mary and says these beautiful words. Mary, honey, the teacher is here and he's asking for you. There is something about these words, something about this idea that Jesus is here for her and is asking for her that all of a sudden fills Mary with the strength to get up out of that chair she's been in for four days and race out the door. Perhaps right now you may feel like Mary. You have been under a fog for days, months, maybe even years. Then I want you to understand these words are also for you. Jesus is here and he's asking for you. I know it doesn't wipe the hard feelings away, but perhaps these words, like they did for Mary, will give you enough strength to get up and run to him. When Jesus sees Mary weeping and then looks and sees a multitude of mourners weeping too, John tells us in the shortest sentence in the Bible, Jesus wept. Now John uses a Greek word to describe Jesus' emotions. Jesus' tears were tears of anger and outrage, anger at death, anger at the pain. Of course he was angry because it's normal to feel angry in moments of grief. Haven't we all at some time when we have grieved felt angry? Angry at the doctors or angry at the hospital or angry at the man who didn't stop his car on time? Angry at cancer, angry at heart disease or Alzheimer's, angry at miscarriage, angry at the person who left you, angry at being left behind, angry at the world, angry at death. Overriding every objection, Jesus orders the tomb to be opened. It's been four days. Lazarus is dead. He'll smell. But Jesus still orders the tomb to be open, and he calls Lazarus by name. Lazarus, he says, come out. Come out of the darkness and into the light. I think John tells us the story of Lazarus because he wants us to know that Jesus calls each one of us by name as well. When we believe and come to him, our eternal life begins. We are never far from his infinite love and the abundant life he promises. Now the men and women in the crowd that day, the people who had come from all over to comfort Mary in her grief, went back to their homes and as John describes it, chose to believe in Jesus. I can picture them lying awake in bed, thinking to themselves, well, if, if Jesus could raise Lazarus from the dead, I mean, maybe, maybe he could raise me from the dead. Maybe he could raise my mom or my dad. Maybe he could raise my brother. Maybe he could raise my friend or my baby. If Jesus could conquer <clears throat> death for this one man, maybe he could conquer death for us all. As I said when I began, John's story of Lazarus sets the stage for Jesus' own death and resurrection. According to John, some of those who witnessed the miracle went back and told the temper leaders what had happened. John writes, The chief priests, therefore, and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What are we doing? For this man does many signs. If we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So from that day forward, they took counsel that they might put him to death. This final one of the seven signs in John's Gospel is a metaphor for life itself. It's about what trust in God can do and does do for us over and over. It's about hope that isn't passive wishful thinking, but hearty, robust, joyful confidence in God's presence. What John wants us to take away this morning is the promise. If Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead, he can bring us to new life if we're willing. 
The question is, which will it be for us? Will you open up your heart and honor Jesus? Will you walk in his footsteps and follow his example? Only you can say who or what will be the Lord of your life. Let us pray. Holy God, creator of life, you call us out of our dark places, offering us the grace of new life. When we see nothing but hopelessness, you surprise us with the breath of your spirit. Call us out of our complacency and routines, set us free from our self-imposed bonds, and fill us with your spirit of life, compassion, and peace. In the name of Jesus, your anointed one, we pray. Amen. Yeah, I come to give life to the